Okay, we're here for Psych 100, Chapter 16, Therapy and Treatment, Volume 2, our last video for the chapters. Last time we talked about the history of my therapy, I wanted to revisit that a little bit. 19 years moving from the style of eclectic. Now, eclectic is kind of using little bits and pieces of different styles. If we go back to the big six, using a little bit of psychoanalysis, maybe going back in a person's upbringing. Uh, we used uh, maybe a little bit of humanistic, trying to make the right choices to better your life. Cognitive, trying to get you to think about things. I would use it bits and pieces, whatever I thought was appropriate for the case. But then, as I mentioned, the insurance company started to turn the screw, so to speak, and they forced us to become more cognitive behavioral. Short-term goals, quick therapy, uh, less money invested, and voila, that's why. Therapy has come a long ways. In the Middle Ages, of course, we put people in our so-called asylums. And these were just picture of places, huge places like Costco, Sefer. It was filled with a number of people uh, just stored there. They didn't have really any type of psychotherapy. They didn't have any medications. Uh, some people were mistreated, abused, and they stayed there for quite some time. Here is a drawing of a number of individuals. Uh, and I think the word bedlam applies. That's a name for actually a hospital, Bethlehem Hospital, but it was called Bedlam because everybody kind of just did whatever they wanted to do. And imagine you being there, or your family member being there, or a friend being there, and having people come and gawk at them for a small fee, almost like watching some type of weird Netflix video. They did attempt all kinds of weird treatments to people, including spinning them around or dumping them into cold vats of water with very limited success. Here we see some of the early psychosurgery, trephination occurring where holes were drilled into people's heads, we think to relieve them of their voices. Here we have the latest ride, California Adventure. And here, this is the tranquilizer chair where a person who might have been bipolar had so much energy, so they would cut off all their senses as much as possible. And the person would stay there for quite some time. Very tragic. Well, fortunately, we had some pioneers throughout our life. Folks like Dorothea Dix in the United States and Philippe Pinel, who really stood up and said, this is wrong. We can't treat people this way. We've got to do better. Instead of chaining people up, mm, squirting hoses with cold water on them, treating them like animals, why don't we attempt to treat them with kindness and respect? Why not give them good quality food? Why not give them fresh air? And this approach that Pinel Dorothea Dix and others promoted helped our mental health system quite a bit. Here's Dorothea Dix, who was a school teacher who made it her business to show compassion, to say we can do better in our mental institutions. Now, I'm not going to lie and say, well, overnight people got better instantaneously, but think about it. Somebody smiles at you, treats you with kindness. It's kind of hard to be angry and bitter towards that person, especially if that's how they consistently treat you. It's very difficult. Enter psychotherapy. Of course, it goes back to the big six. This notion of trying talking cure, trying to get people to look more inwards, to examine their lives maybe take control of their lives. And you know from the big six, there's a variety of different styles and formulations of how we approached. As a review from the very first week of class, 
that looks like Sigmund Freud, and that's his actual fainting couch, and there's his chair. He would listen to people. He would say, free associate, say whatever comes to mind, hoping to tap into the unconscious. We have the humanistic perspective. We had folks like Carl Rogers. I'll show you a picture of Carl here. There's Carl here in the corner, leading a group therapy session, trying to get people to make better choices, make take better control of their lives. And of course, providing a positive environment for them to feel safe and secure in the therapeutic environment. Uh, Philippe Pinel's idea was to give them the fresh air. Well, here's an article I pulled out just the other day, May 2014, not too old. Some young people were suffering from some mental issues being taken for a little picnic by the river. You know as well as I know that for most of us, going out in nature can calm us down, lower our blood pressure, maybe even lower our sugar levels. We have folks like Oliver Sacks, if you remember that gentleman, uh, who represented the psychobiological perspective, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, promoting the uh, therapeutic effect of music. Of course, the behaviorists, looking at reinforcement and punishment. We talked about this in learning, setting up a schedule to reinforce your positive behaviors, things that you want to change in life. Right? Cognitive perspective, really looking at changing our maladaptive thinking, right? Trying to avoid depression, or trying to avoid anxiety, or all those things that may throw us off. Kind of reanalyzing our thinking patterns. Now, along the way, we had uh, individuals who were institutionalized. And in 1962, the Mental Health Act, started by President John F. Kennedy, of course, continued by President Johnson once uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. We had this notion that perhaps it might be better to allow folks a better environment Instead of locking them up in warehouses, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps allowing them to be in the community so they could get better. How are people going to get better if they're surrounded by individuals who are ill themselves? Shouldn't they be in an environment with so-called normal people and living and perhaps working, going to school so they can get on with their lives? Well, that was a very noble goal. And the American public was all in favor of it. The problem with that is where should these people go? And even though the American public was all in favor of this process of deinstitutionalization, people would argue, put them back in the community, but not in my block, not in my neighborhood, anywhere else but here. So folks were placed in urban areas, lower socioeconomic areas, places where more renters, believe it or not, college towns where students come and go and less people to complain about property values if they have group homes. Now, the problem with some of these facilities is not all of them are run very nicely. Uh, some of them were not regulated. Some folks came and went out of these group homes and wound up in the streets. So to this day, we have a number of individuals who are homeless here in the state of California, around the United States, around the world. Many of them are suffering from a variety of ailments, include things like addictions or mental illness. They could benefit from services, but they slip through the cracks. Only now are we concerned even more so with some of these individuals who are dying in the streets due to illness, physical illness. Should have always been concerned about these folks, of course. So when we talked about disorders, one of the things I wanted to point out, one of the techniques, which is a cognitive behavioral approach, actually, is a technique called systematic desensitization. 
So if you've ever suffered or if you know somebody who suffers from a, um, a fear, a phobia, an intense irrational fear, let me show you how you can overcome this fear with this technique. First of all, it involves at least two people. And as you can see, we'll call her Susie. Susie here is afraid of spiders. Do you, do you know what kind of phobia that is? Of course you do, arachnophobia. So she's sick and tired of being sick and tired of being afraid of spiders. So she comes in for therapy. And the first thing we do is we show her a rubber spider. She knows this can't hurt her. She stares at it. And the good thing about this process is she's in control. She does not move until, I mean, we don't move until she tells us to move. So we monitor her stress level and she's ready to move on. So we show her a picture of a spider. Again, not a real spider, just a picture. She gets used to that. We're giving Alara positive reinforcement along the way, by the way. Now she looks at the picture. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way, am I? Yeah, here we go. Let's start that over. First the picture, she holds the picture. We show her the rubber spider. Then we hold the rubber spider. She holds the red spider. All this time we're giving her positive reinforcement. Do keep it up. You're doing a great job. Now she sees the real spider. Are you ready to move on to the next step? Absolutely not. Okay, without rushing her, we're gonna let her choose. Okay, I'm ready. Next up, we hold the real spider. And from a young person who was afraid of a spider on any level, she is now holding the actual spider. You notice that the last blade is missing. What happened was the spider bit her and she died, but we still cured her of her phobia. So I consider this a success story. Let me tell you, this form of treatment is 100% successful. The problem is, is that a lot of individuals refuse to try this particular cognitive behavioral treatment because they have to face the phobia itself. So my advice to you, if you're motivated, is get somebody to help you, somebody who's patient, and you can overcome any kind of phobia, including phobia of remote learning. Okay, time for the review, the last review for the last exam. First question from this chapter is describe the history of my therapy. Remember that? purple sheet I showed you with all the interesting characters on them. Kind of go over the review of that, list the places I worked, how long I worked, what my style of therapy was like. Last question deals with the process uh, of deinstitutionalization institutionalization in the United States. Talk about the history of it, and also whether it worked or not. And again, if you recall, it's kind of a mixed bag. So those are the final two questions. I'll be releasing the exam around the last week of class. So the week of uh, first week of June, I'll be releasing. Uh, you'll probably have one or two days to do the exam like you did last time. And last time, even though I shortened the amount of time, that you had to re respond to the exam, the results overall were amazing. So I'm hoping that you finish strong. Even if you're at a level where you just need a few more points to get to that higher grade, I want you to go for it. I want you to go for all the points you possibly can and see if you can get that B or even an A average for the exam. After the exam, I'll also uh, send out the final 10-point extra credit opportunity. I may have one more extra credit opportunity for you to come sooner than that uh, with a student learning outcome survey that I might be releasing very soon. So be sure to uh, answer those questions accurately as possible and return them as soon as possible. I'll give you the information shortly. All right, take care. Talk to you. Hopefully see you soon, someday.